again. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Jorgensen, I believe you're going to read our civility statement this evening. Thank you, Madam Thank President. You, Madam President. I'll, I'll read the your civility statement. Communicate clearly and concisely with respect for the time of others. Listen objectively, carefully considering the opinions of others. Understand the counterproductive effects of disruptive, demeaning, or intimidating behaviors. Understand and respect district policies and procedures. Maintain a respect for, rich, for the rich history of the district and the efforts of others who have served in the past. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to public comments, recognitions, and reports. 5A, public comments, recognitions, and reports. Um, please submit a request to speak to the Board of Trustees for any agendized or non-agendized items to the superintendent prior to the meeting. Not more than three minutes are allotted for any one speaker, no more than 20 minutes for the same subject. This portion of the agenda is for comments, recognitions, and reports to the board and not intended to question to be a question and answer period. So do we have, and Mr. King, do we have anyone that would like to address the board this evening on any agendized or non-agendized items? There was the one, I think just the one. Okay. Austin Helton. Yes, hello. Hello, we can hear you. Yes, hi, this is this is Austin Helton's dad, actually. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's okay. Thank you guys very much for letting me uh, uh, in uh, this meeting tonight. I thank you very much and appreciate it. Um, I was just uh, asking in the regards of just, you know, um, you know, the policies of what is going to be, you know, obviously going on uh, at school with, uh, you know, masks and what would pertain in uh, if things were to happen with children, you know what I mean? Like uh, rough housing planning or if not doing and what would be taken here, what actions would be taken, you know, if people were to cough or spit or, you know, I'm just wondering because I'm actually at a high risk and my son's actually a little worried. He just wants to make sure nothing or I don't know. I just wanted to ask some simple questions like, you know, about the vaccines and what you guys were going to and taking off masks, what you guys had on take on that. Thank you. We, we will have our staff and then we will have somebody in our staff reach out to you. Is that okay? And I wanted to wish everybody a smooth transition into our near future and we hope everything goes well. Thank you. Thank you. And then next we have CSEA representative Brianna Taxani. Out there. No one else from CSCA or Brianna? Okay, then we'll move on to student representative Kemp Fairbanks. Is Kemp there? Hello all, I hope everyone is doing well. Not much to report except the fact that students are slowly getting back onto campuses, which is awesome. I'm so excited. Um, regarding sports, I wanted to thank everyone because, well, we're getting back into sports, at least on the Vasquez High School, and that's something seniors are looking forward to. And I just can't express my gratitude enough that we we're actually getting back on campus. And a lot of us have lost any hope that we would be back on campus for our senior year, and this is, this is massive. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay, next, we're going to superintendent the gold report, gold standard report, Mr. King. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the uh, COVID update. Um, quite a bit, actually, to share. There's a lot happening, and, and in a good way. Uh, most importantly, the numbers are really coming down in terms of the positive cases. So currently, we're at um, the case rate is 5.6 per 100,000 in LA County. 
Uh, if you remember, at one point we were talking of numbers near to 100 per 100,000. So this is a, a huge difference. Um, this means that uh, if we stay in this zone for another week, you can see on the chart here, we'll be in the red zone. So that 5.6, you see it's um, under 7, between 4 and 7 per 100,000, which means it's still substantial. So they did make the point to indicate that um, by no means are we free and clear. So the, the Department of Public Health doesn't want everybody to, to take off masks and you know go have um, a big party at your house and invite everybody. They're still saying to stick with all the protocols uh, because we don't want to reverse it either. We want to we want to keep the numbers going down, and that's a way to do that. We could. They've now come up with a new metric, and as you know, it seems like every week I'm sharing with you. Uh, either a tweak or a change to the metric. So now they're talking about an accelerated way to get into the red zone. So into the formula, they've now introduced the vaccine. So if they get enough people vaccinated by tomorrow, we could be uh, in the red zone tomorrow. It could be the day after that. Um, if not, and we just stay at the 5.6 per 100,000 and the vaccination stays stable, then it's one more week. But it sounds like from what they said, vaccinations are being administered at a pretty good rate. And so we're on track for this accelerated way to get into the red zone. Um, that also means we can move quicker into the orange and yellow zones, which is not only affect uh, schools, but the businesses and so on. So th this is all good news for us, as Kent Fairbanks pointed out, and I couldn't agree more. It's exciting to see um, some of our students beginning to return uh, to campus. I'm just looking at my notes from this morning's meeting. I want to see if there's anything else that's really pertinent here. Um, this is important. It, even if we go back into the red zone as a county, um, that does not mean an automatic closure for a school. So once we have students back in school, because one of the questions you may ask is, are we going to be going back and forth? We're in school, we're not in school. So no, once we're in school, uh, we can stay in operation. Mm -hmm. The only thing that would um, interfere with that if there was an outbreak. Um, an outbreak is determined by the Department of Public Health. So we would be in contact with the Department of Public Health and they would help us um, make that determination. Um, we, we are doing everything in accordance with the protocols. Uh, the last board meeting I spoke about the resubmission of our COVID safety plan. Uh, we did the correct editings and resubmitted the same day it was given to us. The only way that you know that your plan was approved is if nobody from the state or county tells you there was anything wrong with it. So by default, you know, plans approved after seven days goes by. So we passed that seven days, which means our plan by default was approved, and uh, which is right in line with the passing of our agreement of our MOU with the Acton Advocacy Teachers Association, which will be bringing before the board in a subsequent meeting this evening. So if you didn't see that on the public um, posting, um, that is going to take place this evening after this board meeting. We'll have a second board meeting. Uh, in terms of athletic sports, you're now going to have to make sure that you do testing where both the staff and the students can get their results within 48 hours, particularly for uh, indoor um, sports like basketball. Um, we will allow, at some point once we're in competition, spectators but the spectators will be confined only to um, immediate family members of the players. And immediate family members can sit together, but they need to be six feet, six feet apart from the next family or next person that's not in that household. They're not intended to be um, you know, cheering and chanting, and so therefore you don't have cheerleaders at the football game because the intent is for the football players to have a competition um, and to continue to adhere to the protocols to minimize the um, effects according to the health experts and the spread of the virus. Somebody could say, well, that's not fair. How come the football players get to play football, but the cheerleaders don't get a cheer? Well, by the same token, we could have a 
uh, cheerleader exhibition and not invite the football players. So the football players would not be allowed to attend uh, the cheerleader exhibition if we wanted to do some sort of activity like that. Um, and, and we would be able to do that. So um, uh, just, just a couple points that were made during the meeting this morning. I do want to point out that um, I know it seems like it's been very slow and there's been a lot of frustration by students, staff, community members. 22 districts open for instruction in at least one grade level uh, by March. We were one of those districts. So I just want to point out that out of the 80 districts in LA County, we're, we're doing okay. I, I think we've been methodical and careful and cautious and work with our associations and our board. But I think we've also, you know, heard the community that because we're a small community, you know, we should be able to um, return as quickly as possible. And that's, that has been a large percent of the voice that I've heard in the community uh, based on the surveys we did as well, which were about 75% in favor of returning at this time for in-person instruction. So I'm trying to balance all that out. I, I think we did um, pretty good with that. And the same with our K-6. Uh, the board adopts our recommendation this evening by returning on March 17th and March 22nd. Again, we're going to be in that first court tile. And I think the board uh, and community should be very proud of that. Um, the uh, reopening of Metal Art and K-6 uh, We'll talk about that later this evening with the other MOU. I do want to let the board know that there's going to be a ratification coming before the board for um, air purifiers. So part of the, the MOU that we agreed to with the teachers is that in addition to having um, state, you know, state of the art or up to date current filtration systems in our HVAC system, we also are providing every teacher with a air. Uh, air purifier in the classroom and students um, to help with the safety and mitigate your, um, the spread of any virus. So I think that will be very helpful, but because um, we wanted to get those in time to open on March 17th, the board would need to ratify that at a subsequent board meeting. Um, we want, we, I, don't, I don't think we'll need to ratify this, and that is the um, installation of water uh, conversion system uh, to fill your water bottles. So we're going to go to the Porson Water Drinking Fountains and have installed uh, a system that converts those into a water filling station for students and teachers and water bottles. That is about $45,000. And the, um, the air purifiers, I think, were nine to about $19,000. Both of those things come out of the ESSER two funds, which are COVID-related funds. So I just want to be fair to the public and the board that those are not coming from um, our ongoing expenses general fund. It's coming from funds specifically designed to mitigate uh, the pandemic you know, for schools. Uh, facilities, uh, you can go on, Alex. I have nothing new to report for facilities at this time. And I'd like to make a few comments before we go on to the next slide in regards to the reduction of forces. I truly appreciate the community's input, whether it differed from my own or not, with regard to their comments made on February 25th. People were speaking from the heart about employees that uh, they feel are beloved, that they've known for many years. They were speaking about their opinions with regard to um, the wellness of our students, the wellness of our staff, and their opinions about uh, financial matters. So I, I appreciate all those facts, that, um, the fact that they spoke, and it's certainly their right to, and they did not, I want to be clear that it didn't fall on, you know, deaf ears for our board or for me, and it's important to realize we can only say so much because of privacy and confidentiality related to people's rights during a, a reduction in force or a layoff. Um, I want to convey, that particularly on the, the student wellness piece, I personally heard you. Uh, I, I understand your concerns. I share many of your concerns. And to that end, I want you to know 
that um, we are looking at options and we're looking at ways to uh, uh, address that. And, and again, I don't want to share too much because um, I have to respect the rights of the Crown Service, but I, I hope you understand that it did not fall on deaf ears. We are looking at ways to address that piece specifically. And, uh, and if you'll be patient, um, I think that you'll see that we have a, a good plan in place um, for the fall. So we have our current counseling staff through the end of the school year, uh, barring the resignation before the board tonight. But um, we do have a plan that we're anticipating for the fall. Okay, the next thing I'd like to comment on are several comments that were made in regard to the reductions. Sort of a back checking piece. And I'm not saying anybody was dishonest about their facts. I think, you know, you come to these things like where um, apparently thoughts are shared. Somebody had written, I heard the superintendent's earning $512,683. How can we pay our superintendent over half a million dollars? So uh, I don't make half a million dollars. I think they got that figure. I'm pretty certain off of Transparent California. And that figure was in the last column. And that includes all of my contributions into the state teacher retirement system over the course of my 30 years in education. My current salary is less than half of that. Um, it's $208,000, and that's made public every year when uh, the board uh, uh, gives me a positive evaluation, uh, which they have in the past several years. Why do we pay the superintendent a mileage slave when they go to and from work? I don't get mileage to and from work. So I, I happily ride to and from work every day from Ranch Creek to Munga, but it would be against the law for me to collect the mileage reimbursement for that. Uh, why do Mr. King and two assistant superintendents all receive raises while other employees are losing their job? Um, we didn't receive raises. And in fact, um, I tried to realize the cost savings, and I did. Uh, between the two assistant superintendents, that's a fiscal impact savings of about $14,000 compared to when I joined the district in 2017. Uh, Mr. King accepted, uh, well, well this, is, this is just a fact. I accepted a reduced salary compared to my predecessor, and it's no knock against my predecessor or that board. I just had a different contract and over the course of the past four years had um, that superintendent and that contract been in place, I yielded a, a savings of about $20,000 a year left. So um, I, I'm not making an, uh, an increased salary over um, what others may have made. Um, why do we have so many administrators at the highest level of the district? Um, so again, comparing to what was here before me, we've reduced our administration by three administrators. Uh, we no longer have a um, director of maintenance and operations, uh, which existed right before I got here. Uh, we no longer have a dean at the high school. Um, and recently, we just um, reduced our position of the special education director uh, and these are uh, rough numbers. It's at least the cost savings of $200,000 to the district, probably more. Um, why didn't Mr. King discuss layoffs with the Classified School Employees Association? So I understand, you know, that it, it may seem like we just operated in a vacuum, but we, we did discuss what we could with the Classified School Employees Association, and part of it was no fault of, um, you know, Ms. Taxoni. She just recently became president. So uh, prior to that, and there was a change in the person that um, very clear that we're going to be making serious reductions and, and it would be affecting personnel. So, um, you know, we, we did share what we can, but we also don't negotiate the actual position being laid off. You only negotiate the effects of the layoff. So for example, if the district says we're gonna lay off a custodian, we would negotiate 
well, how are you going to do the cleaning of that classroom then that that custodian do? Oh, here's how we're going to do that. Here's the new schedule. And here's how we're going to cover that. So that's what you negotiate, but not the actual particular layout. Um, how come we didn't do furlough days? So furlough days, just for anybody who doesn't know, if everybody in the district wanted to take off a furlough day, that's worth about $7,500. Remember, we had to find over half a million dollars. So furlough days are, are a good way to address a short-term financial concern. So you might uh, have everybody take five furlough days for the year and, and find a, a little bit of the savings there, but everybody would have to agree okay. to take 20 days per year okay. on a permanent basis. So if all employees wanted to take 20 days per year and furlough days, superintendent, and we have two assistant superintendents, um, and that, that's been um, for quite a while in the district. Sometimes they were called a CBO for the business, chief business official, but the salary and compensation were very similar, really the same. Um, why does the district use district funds to buy snacks for the district office? I, I'm guilty, and that, that's my decision. I, I do have um, water and soda and coffee and tea available for the public. And when we have meetings, um, you know, here, here in the district office, and we have chips. So we, we do provide that to people when they come in. I think it's a courtesy, um, you know, and it's a pretty limited amount of, uh, you know, expenditure. You know, it's huge for that. And we've saved a tremendous amount. If the board's interested on a further presentation, I can share more just in the past couple of years on uh, what we saved in conferences and speakers and so on. So there's, there's um, that would be more for a presentation. So let me come back to my uh, comments. I think I have about 10 more seniors to write to. So if you've not received the letter yet, it's coming. But I have shared with the with the board um, that even if one or two students find value out of those letters, that uh, it was worth writing all 90 letters. So I got this email back from Giovanna. Um, good afternoon. Uh, she said, Dr. King, it's Mr. King, but uh, I don't have my doctor. That's okay, though. I wanted to start off. Thank you so much for your letter. I appreciated it. It boosted mine around. At the end of the letter, you stated that if there's anything we can message you. I wanted to ask if you remembered around a year and a half ago, I told you I'd done some research at a university over the summer. It was a STEM program at Cal Lutheran University. And my research has been displayed for almost two years in the chemistry classroom. And ever since COVID, I heard the school district was trying to recognize students to do their work and represent their school and their district in a positive way. Um, this was fabulous. I appreciate you reaching out to me. Um, I, I want, I, I know I'm putting on the spot a little bit. Can you share a little bit about the project or anything you'd like to share about going through that process? Yeah, um, it was a STEM Academy at Calhoun University. It's, it was basically a summer program where um, I get ready at pursuing a STEM degree and, and at the university or any four-year college. And I earned three units of semester course credit, and I gained valuable research experience, as well as I learned how to professional networking and learn career advice from the professors and the doctors from the university. Well, we're extremely proud of you. Another excellent representation of the kind of students that we have at Vasquez High School and at Actonago Hill Unified School District. Um, Congratulations again, and uh, thank you so much for writing back to me. It was great to hear from you. Thank you so much. I don't know if the board has any comments before I uh, go on, or they, they may save them for the board comments, but um, while she's on the line, I didn't know if you wanted to share anything with her. Oh. Go ahead. Ms. Guzman, that, uh, your I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I can see you're obviously thinking of STEM careers. Um, that, that's some amazing work that's being displayed on the board that you did with, uh, with your, your peers and, and your professor's help. Um, 
it's it's fascinating. I, and, uh, good job, good job, you. That's definitely university level work. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, I actually did it as a sophomore going into my junior year as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very precocious. <laughs> Ms. Guzman, this is Ken Falker. I'm still trying to Google what STEM is, so uh, it might say. <laughs> uh, STEM, uh, it's an abbreviation for science, technology, engineering, and math. Thank you. I'll try to figure out what each of those four mean. <laughs> <laughs> Jovana, is, is that where you want to attend, Jovana? Is uh, Cal Lutheran, is that where you want to go to school? Um, I was accepted and I got a 25000 scholarship, uh, but I'm still waiting for my UCs. Congratulations, and you're going to continue with STEM. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, thank you for representing Vasquez High School and our community. Thank you so much. Mr. Jorgensen, do you have something? Yes, I do. Yovana, congratulations. Uh, I attended California Lutheran College my sophomore year, and it's grown and it's attracted highly qualified students like yourself, and you're representing Vasquez and the acting community. I'm very happy to see that there's other students going to Cal, now CLU, California Lutheran University, it's tremendous work what you've done and you feel very proud. I know your family is and we are. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Mr. Jorgensen. Thank you. Uh, no problem. And, and if you, I sound like I'm late to the game, but if you need a letter for anything, please let me know. I'd be happy to write you a letter uh, for anything you might apply for in the future. Uh, Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Congratulations again. And, and please come back and share with our other students later, please. Please come back and visit and share with our students what you're doing. Yeah, I will. Thank you. All right, we have a video to show. And I, um, just on the athletic piece before I go to the video, um, Mr. Broppe gave me an update, and I think I covered it earlier. Um, currently, they're running boys and girls soccer, baseball, softball. Uh, in collaboration with other member schools of the league, competitions have been scheduled or rescheduled to fit the very needs of each team. Track has been postponed. Uh, we're still looking for a coach. Uh, we're currently working on getting swim started. However, access to the facility due to COVID restrictions and closures may hinder the season. Um, I've already covered the spectator piece, and the board should look forward to an eligibility piece as requested at our next board meeting. Uh, for, for probationary students. And, Larry, will there be boys volleyball in that as well? Um, Sparks or Broadway are on the line regarding volleyball. Matthew should be on the line. Mr. Broadway? Good evening, school board. Can you hear me? Yes. So in terms of boys volleyball, um, that falls into the indoor sports. Um, currently, uh, the state of California has adopted a change to their athletic um, policy to include indoor sports. The um, county has not updated theirs as of yet. Um, one thing that might be tricky is with the indoor sports, as Mr. King mentioned, there's some, some language about testing before returning to practice and as well as um, essentially weekly testing that would need to happen 48 hours um, before competition. So we're exploring the opportunity, um, but the testing piece um, is a bit of a roadblock at this point, but we are continuing to, to work and figure out if it's a viable option to um, offer basketball and volleyball. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brackway. And uh, if, there's no, if there's nothing else on that, then we can move ahead with the video. This is a public service announcement created by both our middle school and high school video production classes. I want to thank those teachers and classes for putting this together. Acton Agua Dulce School District welcomes you to in-person school. 
Students who use district transportation will have their temperature checked and complete the Screener 19 form prior to boarding the bus. When you arrive at school, please head over to the temperature check station. Remember, if you have any signs of illness, please stay home until you no longer have symptoms. You will complete the Screener 19 form on your cell phone or on a paper form. The form can be found on the district website. Once you are checked in, please go directly to your spot. Wait for your teacher to escort you to the class. There's your group always. Wash hands when you come inside. Hand sanitation stations are conveniently located throughout the campus in every classroom. Good morning. Good morning. For your safety, please be sure to maintain six feet of physical distance between you and other individuals on campus. Always wear your mask at school. To maintain social distancing, please remain seated until your teacher gives you permission to move. While on campus, be sure to always wear your mask properly. For a smooth and safe return to school, you will be assigned to a cohort. Remember to stay with your cohort while on campus. I have been working with the district on safety protocols in order to get our students back to school safely. We're excited to welcome you back to in-person school. Their safety is our top priority. And we will be doing everything in our power to make sure that your children are safe here at school. Uh, a great video and that will go public so that we can um, reopen safely and make sure everybody understands the protocols. Uh, for my final comment, I do want to share a, uh, a letter with the public. The board is already aware, but I am prepared with a public statement. It is with a, a very heavy heart that I share with you. I'll be resigning from the school district effective June 30th, 2021. I've truly enjoyed the past four years, and many of you know how much I've enjoyed attending athletic events, academic celebrations, fall festival, women's club, uh, scholarship luncheon, and so much more. Many of you told me when I arrived here, we're different, we're a small town, we're not easy, you'll have to get to know us, you'll love it here, you should move here, and so on. I'd like to think that I did take the time to get to know you, your town, and our students. I'm proud of what we accomplished in the time that I've been your servant leader. I hope that I'll continue to hear from many of you and that I've established relationships that surpass the resignation date's boundaries. I have an opportunity to take on a new and different challenge. It's a new path for me. And, and I am excited about it, but it is very sweet. I will miss the staff and the students and the community very much. I've enjoyed four years of a supportive board and community. Serving the community as a back in an Agadolce has been an honor and a privilege. There are so many things we've accomplished and so much to be proud of. We all did the best we could for our students this year. Teachers, parents, students worked together. We learned a whole new lexicon. Are you muted? See you on Zoom, Nearpod, quizzes, edge protocols, Google Meet, Google Classrooms. 
and the list goes on. But it was also very frustrating. And I am pleased that we're in the top four tile districts in LA County that was able to return students for in-person instruction to date. I've gotten to know many of you quite well and will miss you. I wish each of you the very best in your own lives and your own journeys. And again, thank you for the honor and privilege of being your servant leader for the past four years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. King. Um, do we have any submissions this evening? There is not. Thank you. Board comments. We'll start with Mr. Falstra. Um, thank you. Um, I very much enjoyed that PSA um, with our own students modeling their own behavior, the own desired be their own desired behaviors that will be necessary to keep the return to school not only active but growing. Um, Let's start off with the good stuff. I attended the ASMO meeting the other day. Uh, Meredith out there, you, you and your team are doing a great job. But I, I'm, it's my fear that um, sometimes because of the pandemic, we've forgotten about some of the stuff. We forgot that things were going on in the background. Um, and um, the, the next concert that we see will not just happen. I mean, I used to think, um, when I was a little kid screaming Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I didn't see myself being Eddie Van Halen or something, but I knew it was really important to me. And we have not had that. We've been robbed of all that stuff. And uh, budgets are strained. And, and we all know that the, the State Department of Education looks at the core subjects, math, reading, all of that. That's the most important thing. So when budgets get trimmed, that becomes the focus. And the enrichments like music and art, they go out the window. And when music and art goes out the window, you end up with kids that turn out to be mean. You don't want that. So to stop that, what you need to do is you need to get a hold of the ASMO people at um, start at Metal Art, get your checkbook out, write these people a check. They need your membership right now more than anything. They're trying to find ways to keep the kids interested in the virtual world. I saw some of the stuff they're doing. You need to know what it is. It's very exciting. Math is not exciting to me at all. So I'm an equal opportunity beggar. You need to also get your checkbook out and write checks to your favorite sports groups. You can also go online and find campaigns that teachers are doing for special projects in their classroom. So this is an opportunity you have, unlike anywhere in any public agency, where you can target the money you want to spend and put it right where you want it. So let's start by uh, remembering ASMO. And I want to give a shout out to Sandy Madsen. Without you in the old days, music would not exist in the school. Let's call this what it is. Without ASMO, music access to everyone in elementary level would not exist in that district. So help me by helping them. Thank you. OK, let's get screamy. As I discussed in the last meeting, when we we're talking about position controls and layoffs and position related layoffs, I've made it very clear that I understand government budgeting process. I worked for a governmental agency I have for 20 years. So I understand budgeting. And I understand oversight agency. And I understand their need to have a plan. And I understand that even though they stood by and watched this district take 30% of its revenue, and charter revenue and write these little warning notes and the documents that they would issue to us, that the day would come where they would say, oh no, you're going to have a bad time here. So they don't want to hear that Santa Claus and Easter Bunny are going to bring you some money. They want to know what you're going to do right now that's measurable. So there had to be a plan for them to take a buy. But I made it very clear that it was my expectation that the superintendent would exhaust himself with his team in finding an alternative solution. And at this board meeting, everyone after that, until this is over, I'm going to ask what kind of progress is being made. And I know that some progress is being made. We're seeing some positions move from general fund into uh, being funded or partially funded through alternative funding sources that I won't get into right now. In my world, i called um, enterprise fund. That's who you pay uh, your power bill to. For example, when you pay your power bill, the, the rates are, are set by a rate payers board, and uh, they're highly dependent on the efficiency 
safety of the workers and the cost price. So if you see people sitting in electric trucks at the halfway house at 10 30 in the morning, you should probably wonder why your rates are so high. But I understand enterprise fund, and I'm glad to see that we're looking at that. I'm also uh, looking at um, do I have any ideas about diversifying roles, combining roles, and thinking outside the box that produce additional savings? I hope that I am not alone in understanding the concept that hiring right now is, is a luxury. It's not a luxury. Let's not forget that. And uh, I think we need to keep our focus on the positions that impact students in the classroom, especially the support they will need coming back from a very dark period of time in many people's lives called the darkness of the pandemic. Now, I want to point out that Mr. King told us at the last meeting that he was very cognizant of the effects on individuals and that they did not go nameless and faceless to him. And apparently, Mr. King's kind of might man puts his money where his mouth is because unless I heard wrong, he just put his entire salary and benefit package value back on the table into the general fund. So I don't want to hear any more about Mr. King this and Mr. King that, and Mr. King is top heavy. This man just sacrificed his career for people to stay. Don't let that go unspoken. Now, while I'm on the roll, I appreciate passion. I also appreciate someone's ability to maintain their professionalism and their relevance in the workplace. That is a, in the, in the work market, that is a very personal thing that only you can do for yourself. And I appreciate people sending me emails that tell me who they think I should hire, who their favorite person is. Well, I only hire one person and the rest of these people far outweigh what I can do. And I sit, my hiring is limited to the person that sits in the superintendent's chair and it appears that I just lost him. But I work for a public agency and I understand the danger of trying to influence a process, a hiring process that is supposed to be objective and is funded by taxpayer dollars. So I certainly wouldn't do that at work and you certainly wouldn't find me or any prudent public sector employee that works for an agency that is funded by taxpayer dollars going through a scandal in which it appears that you as a public agency official yourself are off somewhere else doing something like that. So I understand that people that don't know that, I understand the passion, but the quickest way to get me to hit auto-delete is to slander the staff that works for this that I sit up here to try to help through my work here and all the rest of the board members or to tell me how to influence what's supposed to be an objective process. Thank you. Mr. King, I really don't know what to say. I will have more to say about this later. Mr. Fox, on you. Thank you. Um, for the, the parent who called in earlier, I, I hope the video, I think it was Mr. Helton, I, if I jotted the name down right, I hope the video gave you some idea um, of you know what's what's in store, um, and of course, as Mr. King said, somebody will reach out to you to to have an interactive Q and A. But um, I, th I thought the video was very helpful, and along those lines, I, I would like to very much extend uh, my gratitude to the uh, the district staff, certainly the teachers as we continue to reinvent what school looks like. I mean, in the last year, this is probably our third invention of what school looks like. And I understand it's exhausting. I understand it's stressful. I'm very, very grateful to all of you. Um, I, I, uh, I too, and you know, it's, it's, we're returning and still, and still, uh, COVID is out there, and I can understand the hesitation. Um, but, uh, you know, kids, uh, teachers were always the most important people other than, you know, me and their mom and maybe their grandparents to my children. And that kind of bond helps education. And that kind of bond is, I think, is probably fostered by, uh, you know, just in, in person, even if it's six feet apart, interaction. 
And um, I, I, I look forward to the kids being able to have that with their very, very important teachers um, as, as we're able to. But for me, when I look past, I look back at those last four years and I, I, I really appreciate and value very much the way uh, Mr. King has put uh, what students are doing at, at the forefront. And we see it every time we see one of these little videos. We've seen them over the last four years. We've seen it when the kids come in and dance for us, the dancing key. And he's been uh, uh, very, very um, systematic in making sure that we see what the kids are doing, we share what the kids and their teachers are doing. And he's been very systematic, I believe, in, in uh, going out and being on the schools, meeting parents, meeting kids, engaging stakeholders. And uh, that's your real strength. And I'm I've, uh, um, I've, uh, very grateful for having uh, had that here at this district the last four years. And I wish you the best of luck. But I think that um, at the end of it, when we come out of some of the pain that we're seeing now, I think we'll miss, we'll miss you. I will miss you. So thank you very much. That, that's it for me. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, quick note on the PSA. I thought it was put together very well. Thank you to everybody that, that joined in on that. And uh, the information that was put out. I think it was very informational for uh, the kids. Mm -hmm. And the parents are coming back to the, uh, the schools um, shortly. Um, uh, hopefully, as we go forward and we start to open more and more, um, that we all look for what's the fair deal in this process, um, not wanting to lean one way or the other, one person wanting more than the next, or, or whether it's staff or teachers or students and parents. You know, we need to start figuring out the common ground uh, in this district, and I hope that uh, everybody starts to uh, kind of come together during this, this time where we're uh, trying to right the ship. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to add. Uh, Mike and uh, Mr. Paul's graph, they, they pretty much uh, lay it all out there. What I will say is, uh, Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're, you're departing. Um, you know, I came into this with a different set of glasses. Um, a lot of what you touched on tonight, false information was out there amongst the public. Um, a lot of rumors, a lot of people's opinions, and not a lot of fact. Um, I wish that you would have explained yourself maybe in more detail at the times. Because I think there was a lot, a lot of people had a lot of questions about who you were. Uh, having been here for the last two months and talking to you on a personal level, uh, you're much different than what the perception is that's out there. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you for your service to our district. Thank you to your service to my hometown. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best in the future. Um, and uh, hopefully, again, uh, as a community, parents, we can start focusing on the common goal, which is giving our students and our kids the best possible learning environment in this valley. There's no reason why it can't be, but I tell you what, there's so many opinions from this group and that group, and it, it, it has to stop. It's just ridiculous. Everybody needs to start working together and remember why we're here. And uh, that I'll pass it on. Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, I want to uh, recognize that I have the same, same uh, excitement uh, and uh, energy that Dan and I are returning. But but as we work our way through this mirage, there's going to be different expectations from the staff, from parents, from students from everybody engaged. And we all need to do our part to make it a success as we move one more step closer to full open and full enrollment. We need to support each other. We need to be respectful of each other as we go about the distance and the masking and 
the processes to getting on and off campuses. I want to thank our staff and teachers for prepping the campuses and your willingness to do what you can for our students. And I want to express the thanks to the parents for the patience they've had in working through the frustrations as we filtered all the news and what we can and can't do from parties that are far and away, away from, and I would all say, in our school, and our district. It's been a very challenging time for everybody. I think the parents have significant levels of stress in their home. The kids have it. And so as we get back to campus and we start to read join our students and our families on each one of our campuses. I want to wish all of our students the greatest of successes. I want to make sure that they know that they're welcome back and they need to work and support their peers, work with each other. There's going to be a lot of questions. If there's questions, go to your teacher, go to the staff. Be sure to exchange ideas and ask questions and get clarity so that you can have a successful return to the campus. With regards to uh, you, Mr. King, I, I know that uh, when you first got hired, I made an appointment to come down and sit one-on-one -on -one with you while I was still employed out at Vasquez High School. So I wanted to make sure that you got something from the field about what was going on here in our district with our schools, with our students. So I wanted to give you a perspective of a staff member and what I heard in meetings and on the board and on campuses different sporting events. The progress and the enhancements that you have brought to the district are to be commended. You worked hard through those. I appreciate your diligence and your patience. The challenges that you face, you know, the real ones and sometimes imagined ones, you did with respect, you did with honor, and I really I, I commend you for that. As, as my Fellow colleagues have said, I wish you the best. We're going to miss you. You've brought us through a very challenging time, and particularly with the pandemic things that nobody could have planned for. But yet we stayed, you kept us focused on doing things and having to make decisions and giving us alternatives so that we could make decisions in the best interest of our students. I wish you the best, and I hope that everything gets better for you. And uh, on a side note, I think you'll have a little bit of crack time for the trumpet, so I wish you the best, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my comments tonight, I, you know, I have a couple of students that it was exciting tonight. Just, uh, I want to um, recognize Ms. Guzman again. That was very exciting about her her recognition and all of her accomplishments, uh, accomplishments so far. Uh, Mr. Fairbanks, what a great way to start off our evening is your excitement to come back to school, and I think that's what a lot of our students are feeling right now, and so um, a big shout out to all of our students. We're excited to have you back. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Helton, I, th I hope the video did help with your question and please reach out because we do um, have a plan to make sure our students are safe and their return. But we want to make sure that you're comfortable as well because your um, students are all very important to us. So um, thank you for your comments this evening. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank all of our um, I'd like to thank our ADA and all the people that work to um, come to the table and negotiate. That was a lot of work and, you know, it's not easy, but it's great to see that people came together and came to some kind of um, consensus, for lack of a better word, to get this work done and get our students back. So it shows that we do all have a common goal. So I appreciate all the hard work that goes into that. Um, Saturday's workshop, I'd just like my fellow board members to know that it was great working with you on Saturday. Um, with everything going on, we decided, yeah, we're gonna move forward and we have work to do to help our district move forward. And it was great to um, work with them to get to know them a little bit better personally as well, because we don't see each other very much or talk other than a, a board meeting. So that was very nice. Um, as far as Mr. King, we're gonna miss you a great deal. Um, you've done a lot for our district. You brought the, you helped with the gold standard. When I first met you, the first thing you were working on was mindset. And so um, it's funny how important that has come to play in a situation like this, um, having a, a growth mindset. And so um, I appreciate that work. Um, you've done, you have a heart of gold, like our state goal. You model that the way you care about people. You're a people person. Um, 
you've done everything about attending things the way you light up when you see students that's how i know you're in it for the students that's what it's all about you can't fake that so um i appreciate that um there's not a lot of guys like you that will dress up like a cat either so you've done a lot of quirky things since you've been here like and i forgot playing the, playing your instrument so um, you've jumped in and you've really enjoyed working with the students. And it's unfortunate that we haven't had a great year where you could do the things that you love. So maybe that kind of got you down this year is not being able to do it. But um, we do have work to do. So I'm not saying goodbye tonight because we have you until the end of June. And uh, as a board president, I haven't forgot that. We have a lot of work to do. So um, I just want you to know that I have enjoyed working with you. And uh, we wish you the best, but we're not saying goodbye. We're going to say get busy. <laughs> so, um, so with that, that's all we have as far as that goes. So we're going to move on to 8A. We're going to approve the consent agenda from items 8A through 8C. Can I get someone to move this in? Thank you, Chad. Second? I'll second that. Um, any comments or questions? I have one. I'm. I didn't. Maybe it's just me. The minutes were the minutes in the agenda. I thought I saw. Yes, that would be eight B minutes. Yeah. Were they were they posted on the district website? I looked and didn't see that. I see the attachment. Are they in there? Yes. Were they posted on Monday? If they weren't, then we'll table it. And Approve the next time. I didn't see the attachment. Computers mess up. We can just be safe and put them on the next one. You I want, to, you want to table? table it to okay. For approval and, and review it the next time. So we're going to table B just to make sure that 8B, the minutes were in there. Thank you, Mr. Fallsgraff. Other than that, I have nothing. So we're going to uh, move in 8A and 8C, which is the consent calendar and the warrant register, tabling B. I'll move those in. Okay. I'll go ahead and second. Any other comments, uh, questions or comments? Then let's go for the vote. Paul's graph, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Tim Jorgensen, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. That's a five zero. Thank you. That's that's moved in. Next we have ten A personnel action report. Can I'll move that in. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Just want to comment that um, this was the one item that I mentioned at the beginning of the board meeting okay. amended, mm -hmm. and you'll notice that the task was by you know layers school counselor so she's been added to this uh, personal action report since it was produced and I just want to wish the uh, folks well on here that um, uh, we have a teacher Jennifer Martin uh, metal art was uh, uh, moving on to thing this year um, David uh, Kubler our principal uh, resigning effective June 30th 2021 uh, Karina Larson, a little bit sooner, March 19th, wishing them all well. Uh, Brianna Taxoni, who wears a couple of different hats in the district, as you know, and the uh, CSA president as well. Uh, Brianna, wish you well in, in, uh, as you move forward. And um, I think that, that that's, that's concludes my comments regarding the park. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I just want to echo you, Mr. King. I think. Thank everyone for their service. There's um, a lot of work to be done, and we appreciate everyone that's been working for us and that have moved on. So we wish them the best. Okay, let's call for the vote. Paul's well, graph, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Tim Jorgensen, aye. Intelligence, and I. So that is half. We have 11A, adoption of the Los Angeles County Plan for Expelled Students. Can I get someone to move this? I'll in? move that. That one is just a couple of brief comments on this item. It's part of a triennial update and it's an ed code requirement by the, that the county uh, superintendent work along with district local education education superintendents 
um, regarding expulsion of students. And they want to make sure that uh, the countywide plan enumerates existing educational alternatives, identify gaps in educational services, and identifies plans for filling those services and gaps. Um, the, the one limitation in our district, and thankfully, um, very seldom do we do an expulsion, but we don't have a lot of places to place a student. We have a, one comprehensive high school. Now. That's that's our only game in town. You know, we're the big district, the Antelope Valley, where you have nine comprehensive high schools. So if you wanted to do a suspended expulsion, you can put them from high school A to high school B and, and see how they do over there for a year and then they can return to their original high school. Or they can go to an alternative high school or a continuation high school. We don't have those options here. The only option we have is um, in San Fernando Valley that the county you know, will tell us that we can send them to this school. So typically what we do is if the parent requests it, we try to help them out with some charter options. But they're not interested in going to the one offering we can do with the San Fernando Valley. But, um, but anyhow, this is this is a uh, um, kind of an industry standardized that uh, uh, they've done. Um, yes, I, I would want to remind everyone that when we get to the point where we have to expel students, that it's usually based on social and cultural failure on campus. And life for that student, if you track that out later, can be horrendous. So the next time we want to make a comment about somebody to make herself feel good or, or something like that, that's kind of where the stuff starts and people react. People like to be recognized. Some people do it silently and through um, how, how much they work and how well they treat others with good work for somebody who needs it. Others seek it in more destructive ways. And when we start seeing students like that, kind of take it to yourself and ask, you know, why is this person acting like that? Catch it in the pod because if you don't, the county school, you come in there new, you know nobody, and everybody there is going to expel. And then that, the game turns into something for sure. That's what it Anyone else? When it pops, I, can bring it I, I just have a couple of comments. Tim, I don't know if you had a comment before I start. No. OK. Um, first of all, I, I do know that this plan talks about PBIS. So um, I know Mr. Brockway has been working with that. So. Just want to like, even though we've had COVID, I want to make sure that we're continuing that work because I know that LACO is starting to send stuff about the next year's training and things like that. Also, um, in gap number three, it talked about alternative placement, which you kind of hit on. But can you have an MOU with a, another nearby district? That was, I'm not sure. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so the MOU, I think, can take place, but do we do that at the time there's an expulsion or do we set that up prior to? I just. I didn't know. That's a great question. Yeah. So if you could look at gap yeah, three and, and look into that, um, because um, every student is important, as Mr. Paul's graph is pointing out, so we want to make sure that we give them the best of But like you said, that's one of the joys of our community. We don't have a lot of a lot of that going on. And that's a big shout out to our school administrators that are making sure that our students are safe and we have a great campus. So thank you, school administrators. Um, next, we have 12A, second interim report for 2021. Mr. King. Well, first of all, let me get this moved in. I'll move it. Paul's draft. Chad Walker here. And as we've talked about uh, very often this year, um, this, this is a critical part of what the board approves and adopts in terms of our fiscal sovereignty plan. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Mercer. Hello, board members. How's everyone doing? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so tonight, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you tonight. Tonight we'll be reviewing uh, Acting Up Adults Say Second Interim Report. And so let's get right into it. Let me see if I can move the slide over. Okay, so the fiscal reporting cycle, if you remember a few months ago um, in October 34, uh, October 31st, the district came and pre presented the first interim report to you. And just so you guys could follow the timeline, the first interim reported all the financial transactions for the district from July 1st up to October 31st. And then now we're in March and we're going to be coming and reporting the second interim, which covers the financials from July 1st to January 31st. So it gives you a good seven months 
of all the transactions and changes that happens from first interim for revenues, expenses, any fund transfers, and we'll take a look at all the other funds and the multi-year projections and kind of give you an update from what has happened from October 31st to January 31st. And so, so when we develop the budget, first interim, second interim reports are kind of an update to the budget. So we just have to make sure that the next two slides that you're going to be viewing, the budget considerations that we have to take into the, to, to planning is the strategic plan of the school district and our educational plan. The budget is not a budget without the LCAP. The LCAP is our educational goal, and that is what the budget is built around. So we have to make sure that all the goals and actions that we develop in our LCAP are accounted for and tracked accordingly in the budget. And so the second report, what and why, kind of already mentioned that, that we're going to kind of give you an update on all the financial transaction changes from October 31st. So you have to, by state law, at code 42130, uh, the school board has to certify twice a year on the financial status of the school district. And you have to either certify in positive certification, qualified, or negative. Positive certification meaning the district will be able to meet our financial obligations for the current fiscal year and the next two fiscal years. A negative certification meaning we will not. And qualified meaning we may, we may not. So happy to announce tonight that we will, we are still going to be certifying positive that the district will be able to meet our financial obligations for the current fiscal year and the next two fiscal years. So before we get into the details, I just want to kind of give you an outline of the budget. The general fund is our main budget. It compromises of two different uh, pots of money. You have unrestricted dollars that are used for instructional and operational purposes. Then you have a restricted pot of money that comes in. And the restricted side is normally your categorical funding, which is your Title I, Title II, Title Three. You have special ed in there. You have maintenance. And those have to be used for a particular purpose. And so those dollars are earmarked and they have to be spent in according to the guidance that the federal government normally puts out what you can spend title money on. And so then we have our other funds that we have fund 13, which takes care of entire child nutrition. Uh, child nutrition is self-funded, but it's a completely different operation. You can view it as, and so that takes care of the staff salaries, the equipment, the inventory um, entirely. And so it's self-sufficient. And the only way that it impacts the general fund is if they're not able to manage their re the revenue and their expenses, and if they borrow money from the general fund, then we have to, you know, uh, transfer money over. Then we'll look at the other funds, fund 14, fund 17 we have. Uh, we'll look at fund 25, which is our developer fees. We'll look at fund 35, and then we'll look at fund 40 as well. And so our minimum reserve, since we are, uh, our ADA is less than a thousand, is a minimum of 4%. And we'll get into the details shortly. And so let me see here. So this is our LCFF revenue. And this is going back to the general fund is our biggest pot of money. And this is an illustration of how the bucket is filled. And so LCFF funds is, stands for Local Control Funding Formula. It's ADA-driven and not enrollment-driven, so it, it depends on, you know, the number of students in the chairs. And so we get our majority of our funds based on our ADA, and they pay they, based on the current year or the previous year, whichever ADA is higher. And so our pot right now for ADA, we get about, $8.1 million, and then they fill it with grade, grade span adjustment, meaning making sure we keep our uh, K to three sizes from 26 to one. And then on top of that, um, we get what's called supplemental and concentration grant money, and that's based on our unduplicated pupil count. Unduplicated pupil count on this population of students that, uh, that, are, that fall into English learners, mm -hmm. low income, and foster youth. And our district, on an average in the past three years, was around 54%. I think in the upcoming years, we're at 56%. And so right now, we just get supplemental uh, dollars. 
uh, that equates to about nine hundred twenty-four thousand dollars. But in the out year, we'll get another. I think it's another like almost fifty thousand dollars because our we're right above that fifty-five percent. So we'll receive a, a little bit of extra money in that area. And then they fill the bucket up with um, old dollars from when. Revenue limit was out before LCFF funding, which accounts for home to school transportation and uh, block grant funding that equates to about $545,000. And so our enrollment right now is at 920. And if you look at previous years, it was about 1,040 in 2019 20. Our funded ADA, like I mentioned, is at 979.60. Uh, and this is based on prior years ADA. And um, our unduplicated count sits at about 515, so we're at about 56%. We have the STRS and PERS rates that were updated based on the governor's proposal, and there will be, they will be reflected in the multi-year multi projection. And so Governor Newsom came out with his January budget proposal, and those are the latest assumptions that we can use at this point. Mind you, it's just a proposal. There were a lot of good things that he did state that we would be getting, you know, extra dollars in the out years. But most of it is just one time, and we'll have to wait and see um, for the May revise to see what goes through to actually develop our, you know, our next year's budget accurately. Um, our bargaining unit negotiations. They were initiated with ADA and um, CSA, but it was just for code purposes. Our oversight fees from the charters for, were reduced from 3% projected reimbursable amounts for the 12 charter schools and facility fees were charged accordingly. And so what we projected was, we didn't even, we're not even projecting to charge up to 1%. What we did was took a more conservative approach and so we're looking at about 0.70% that we would charge just to be, just to play it safe. Um, no funds at this time were going to be transferred to the general fund for capital improvement projects. There is a transfer that's in the budget that I'll get into when we talk about uh, fund 14 for deferred maintenance. And so we'll look at that. But so from 2019 to 20, we lost about 119 students and we lost about 45 prior to that. Our multi-year projection is for the out two years is we're projecting to lose about 33 uh, students. Uh, we're funded on average daily attendance. So if you take the $9,939,000, divide that by 979.60, which is our ADA, you get about $10,146 per student. And so if you subtract our ADA that we had at last year at 1028 by 979, that's about it's about $491,000 decrease that we're looking at. Um, that's what it equates to about, you know, based on our loss of ADA. So attendance is, it matters. So it, it's a big thing that we do need to work on. So combined general fund revenues, this is a look at the overall picture of all the revenues uh, combined. Uh, from first interim to second interim, there was a slight change. Uh, our revenue went down about $12,463, and we'll get into the details in the next slides of what happened with revenues and expenses. Our total expenses also decreased, which is a good thing, about $40,129. So that made our deficit spending drop about $27,666. In the end, when we reduce our deficit spending, what it does is increases our ending fund balance, so actually increased our ending fund balance by $27,666. So if we look at the general fund breakdown of the total $16 million, and now we'll get into you know why it decreased and what happened, uh, it's important to note that out of that $9.6 million, that the supplemental concentration is $924,000. And that has to be, it's, it's, it's somewhat restricted dollars because it has to be spent uh, for that particular population to provide increased and improved services for the unduplicated students. And so we saw a zero dollar change from our LCFF funding from the first interim to the second interim. Our federal 
dollars actually went up about forty two thousand five hundred thirty seven dollars and that was due to us uh, actually updating our federal revenue to the final apportionments uh, from the CDE so that we updated our Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV to match our final allocations that we're going to be receiving from the feds. And that's uh, that's why it increased 42000 Our local revenue decreased, and that was just an adjustment on their ADA and um, their LCFF for the charter, so that decreased slightly. Our charter revenue here, as you can see, unaudited actuals was how we pretty much um, estimated to close out our year in 1920. We budgeted $4.1 million for the charter revenue. Adopted budget was the same thing. At second interim, we have adjusted that revenue down to $996,122. And that is reflected in the out years as well. And as I mentioned before, it's not projecting, that 996,000 is not the full 1%. Uh, it equates to about 0.70% of oversight fees that we're projecting to uh, charge the charters. Our general fund expenditure summaries, moving on to the salaries, the certificated salaries for first interim to second interim, um, increased about 184,000 and that was just due to late hires and actuals that were not able, actual expenses that weren't, that didn't hit the books when we, at first interim times. There were some late hires such as principal RSP teachers along with step and longevity increases that happened after October 31st. So we updated that. Our classified salaries went down and our benefits followed and that's because we had we have vacancies in the classified areas. We have clerks, bus drivers, IAs, maintenance workers, library aides, and that's what's driving that cost down. Our books and supplies does include the, the funds for the science book adoption at 350,000, but we went and looked at other areas when we were able to decrease materials and supplies in other areas. Our services also went down about 42,000. And that's due to you know staff training, instructional programs, specifically our special ed professional services cost uh, were coming in a lot lower than what we initially budgeted. And so overall, our expenditures decreased about $40,129. So if we look at the MYP, this is um, just a quick kind of overview of years out. If you look at the green line, which is total projected revenues, it's about 16671000 for this year. I'm just going to go down the columns and we'll go through each column and kind of explain to you what's going on. Our projected expenses are at $17,168,000. And so we see, uh, we see a, a deficit right there of $496,000 uh, deficit spending. And so on top of that, we have $1,000 that we have to by CDE uh, maintained for um, revolving cash. And then we have our restricted resources, meaning um, restricted, this is specifically for the routine maintenance and uh, regular routine maintenance account. By Ed Code and CDE, we have to transfer 3% of all of our, of our total general fund expenditures over to routine maintenance account. And that has to be done every year. So you see that negative every year. And that's it estimated. So as our expenses go up, if they go up, then that cost goes up as well because it's a 3% of our total expenses. Then we have a signed $2.4 million, and that's for a charter and legal issues that we're going to be coming with. So we have it earmarked for that. Um, so our reserve levels, as you can see, this year at 44.9%. Next year, you see they go up a little bit, 47.58. And this goes back to the COLA that Governor Newsom stated. So in 2021, we did not receive a COLA, which is a cost of living adjusted adjustment that they give you, which is a percentage that they give you on top of your LCFF funding. So you just multiply 2.31%. That's what it was ex estimated to be. And so we never got it. They, they zeroed it out. No one got it. So in 21-22, what they're projecting is a double COLA for one year. So that's why you see that uh, it's 
it's a little bit inflated because we are counting for 3.84% of COLA to be uh, received next year. And that was what he had on his uh, governor's proposal. And so, then, the, but the out years, the COLA goes down to 2.98. STRS and PERS uh, increases and decreases were included in our you know, salaries and benefits. And so STRS in 2021 is at 16.15%. They are doing a slight decrease next year. Next year, the STRS rates have dropped down to 15.92%, which is a 2.18% decrease. But in the out years, 2022-2023, it jumps right back up from 15.92 to 18.10. PERS, we're not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel. PERS continues to go up. It's at 20.70%. And next year, it's going to 22.84%. And the year after that, it's projected to go up to 25.50. So the cost of benefits continue to rise. CPI, which is a recommended a tool that they uh, estimate for us to use uh, for inflation purposes, and they want us to apply that to our expenses, like our supplies and materials. We chose not to do that, so that way we did not inflate our expenses to keep them flat. Um, Charter oversight fees also were reduced. We already talked about that. And so that's what's looking, that's how our MYP is looking. So what we really need to focus on is this deficit spending. You see that the following year, it's only at negative 22,000, but that's because of the COLA that really helps out a lot. We also see these um, expense adjustments, $726,000 here, and then there's an additional $325,000 expense adjustment there. Even after those adjustments, um, there's, we're still deficit spending. So uh, we have to watch our expenses and look at what we're doing in our operations to get that under control. Because if you take our ending fund balance and divide it by, you know, if we continue, like if we looked at, we normally do a five year multi year projection, and I looked at the, the next year and the following year out. And we're projected to be deficit spending about 742000 If I divide that by our ending fund balance, we have, if we go and continue at that rate, we'll be out of money in about 10, 11 years. So we have to change that process of deficit spending. So let's jump to the other the revenues and expenses they have a good control of. And so... Uh, their ending balance is going to be at about $85,287, and so they will be self-sufficient without the need to borrow from the general fund. Fund 17 is just residual dollars. I think it was an old project that you know the district had, but it's just $3,000 that's sitting there that could be used for capital facilities projects, or this could be this fund could be closed out, and that $3,000 could be moved back over to the general fund. Um, fund 14 is our deferred maintenance fund and this is the transfers that we want to talk about uh, today so we have we have a pretty healthy fund balance and so fund, deferred maintenance is money that we we normally transfer $325,000 from the general fund over to deferred maintenance and that's to you know emergency expenses that occur in, in our facilities uh, you know they're aging facilities things could go wrong and at least we have funding set aside so to account for those but at this point and then we also have uh, capital leases that we pay and so I looked up the capital leases and we owe exactly $325,000 for our capital leases uh, but they're spread out for the next three years so the recommendation was to do a one-time transfer from the general fund that we were budgeting to do anyways and to get that get that capital lease out of the way and just pay it out so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't carry on. Uh, we don't carry on that liability for the future years. And that way, and then stop all the transfers from the general fund to fund 14, because as you can see, it still has a $500,000 balance. And what I was recommending was we'll look at project from project from then on to see what money actually needs to be transferred over. So if something breaks and something happens, we'd have to bring it back to the board and say, hey, this is the cost, this is the emergency. At that point, you know, just, just for transparency purposes, uh, Fund 25 is Capital Facilities Fund, which is our developer fees, and it has a balance of 369000 in there. Fund 40 
is a fund that was opened a long time ago, and it was for projects that you know the district had. However, those projects are all done, and there is a fund balance of four hundred four thousand uh, dollars. This can be left here, or you can decide to move this back to uh, the general fund. That's that would be my recommendation to close it and to uh, move it back to the general fund. That way. Um, the money is there in fund one where it's needed. And those it's a one-time savings, so at least it'll help the general fund one time, about $500,000. And then you have the last fund here. Fund 35 was your VHS project. And so what we were thinking when we were developing the second interim is that we would have a final invoice that from, um, the, from the project that would cover the remaining balance that was sitting here at about $8,400. But we looked at all the invoices, everything's been paid up, there's nothing extra. So there's about $8,600 sitting in this account. By law, we cannot move this out because it was um, for a particular project. So all we can do with this is leave this funding here. And if, if in the future there's any uh, facility projects, it has to be used for that purpose. So in summary, uh, the district is able to meet its financial obligations for the current year and the next two years will be, summer, uh, will be certified positive. Um, revenues increased, like we talked about, um, based on the assumptions that we use for Governor Newsom's uh, budget. There is COLA that's added in the out years, which is which is good for a change because for a while they were, they were projecting a 10% decrease in our LCFF, which would have been a disaster. Uh, decline in enrollment is projected. Uh, STRS and PERS rates are included as well, the increases and the decreases. Um, deferred maintenance definitely should be looked at and assessed to see if we want to continue to transfer the $325,000 over or should we stop. Um, and that's about it. We will, you know, thanks to the board that we do have a high level of reserves. Um, that we don't have to worry about borrowing or doing a trans. And so uh, the 726,000 expense adjustment, and, and I said this when we talked about it during budget study last fall, those are services for students and their people. And that expense adjustment is the vote that we had uh, last board meeting or the board meeting before, as unfortunate as it is. And you can see, though, that that expense adjustment, without it, we'd be at, at $726,000 plus $22,000. We'd be at about a $750,000 deficit this year, or next year, I should say, rather than just $22,000. Is that a correct interpretation? Yes, yes. Yes, it is. Okay, and now, of course, that fact that that number lives in the next column uh, doesn't mean there's another 726,000 coming on that line. It means, unfortunately, we don't think we can restore those services in the following year. Uh, and so it's just so carried on. You got it. Yes, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. but, but notwithstanding that, because of declining enrollment, and because I believe the way in which uh, your ADA for one year follows the year before or your current, whichever is in your benefit, uh, eventually the loss of 100 students comes into the numbers. And so you got it. We're held harmless uh, this year, but going next year, we're, we're, we're not held harmless. Exactly. So you, you get a, like a one-year buffer, but ultimately the numbers hit the books. And so um, what what your chart on the right-hand column shows is a $600,000 deficit, even with $325,000 more adjustments. Yep. Yes. Yes. And, and the further out years, I didn't put a, I'll do that next time. I know. because So we have the benefit because we, we went out five years at our budget study. And I, I guess I'm just 
like I said, part of it I know the answer is because I've been doing this for a long time. We just got a budget study. Uh, so part of it is to remind, you know, the audience that we have a structural deficit. We did not fix the structural deficit with the pain of the last vote. We kind of addressed it halfway or so, or so. We have more adjustments to make to fix our structural deficit. You cannot run a structural deficit because we don't get to print money. And so, I, I, you know, I just I want people to know it for transparency. Next year will be a tough year. It'll be tough on this board. It'll be tough for staff. It'll be tough ultimately for students. Um, I'm surprised, but there's plenty of time to adjust this. That. Uh, you know, you're letting this, the deficit grow back up to five, six hundred thousand dollars out there, <laughs> you know? and that's because to put that five hundred thousand to fix it means it's not three hundred twenty-five thousand. It's like uh, eight hundred twenty-five or nine hundred twenty-five thousand, which is even more painful than we did this year. So, um, this is what it means, you know, when when there's less students around, and so that brings me to another vote, and I just want to make sure people understand why I vote the way I do. It's not meant to put any of my board members in a difficult spot. But the 726,000 from this year and the 800,000 from next year, that's $1.5 million. And I think you said that uh, ADA is about $10,000 per student. That's yes. 150 students. That's how many students in our very small district are split off at the charter school. Now you'd say, and I'm not saying, because you know, I voted for that school as a junior, as an elementary school and I support choice. I think we can afford it elementary level. And I'm not saying all those students come back, but I'm just pointing out that you're seeing the numbers of bifurcating a very small student body. And going forward, if our upper grade levels get bifurcated, these numbers get worse. And it makes it harder and harder to provide a comprehensive educational experience uh, or offering on either side. So it's a warning to my board members, just in general, you know, it's very hard to run comprehensive programs on a thousand students and shrinking especially when you divide them in two at all grade levels or, or split them in some ratio. And um, uh, why do I even mention that? Because that other vote is in the past because there's more votes coming. Okay, there's MOUs on facilities and everything else. And, and um, you know, frankly, all our votes are connected. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not good. We got pain next year and if we continue bifurcating the student body, that pain gets worse. So um, thank you for your work. And we just we just got to um, head into this structural deficit and chip away at it and hope it doesn't get worse. Thank you. I, just, I really am not going to follow up with that. I mean, uh, Mike does a very good job of breaking down. I will say thank you, Mr. Marissa, uh, for your work and your uh, comprehensive report to us. Appreciate it, Mr. And I'll the sake of time, we'll just pass it along. Tim. Mr. Jorgensen, do you have anything to add? Um, although, Mr. Mirza, I don't have a lot to add because I, you know, other comments, but I just want to thank you. It's a very short time that you've had a lot of work to do. I know a lot of work looking, you know, more than just the numbers, looking at our goals and health cap and whatnot, and looking at all of this. So thank you, and I can't wait to meet you in person, but thanks for jumping in because this was a lot of work in a short amount of time. But I do, um, I do agree with Mike. It was nice to see that other graphic. It really broke it down for us, so we, we appreciate that.
Um, if Mr. Jorgensen isn't there, does anyone else have anything? Let's move one more time. Uh, this is not a debate. Everything that Mike is saying is real. Uh, it's been real for a number of years. I want to point out that, the, that there's a linear relationship between how much this district is being subsidized by charter revenue and exactly the cutback. So the number's there. There have been savings made along the way. There have been efficiencies gained in positions, but still, there's a linear relationship. To Mike's point, Mike puts the rocket into space. It feeds whatever you do on the Earth. Okay. Now, if I go around and yell out to every every time I don't get what I want and blame Mike's company verbally and slander the company verbally, and get in the newspapers and trash Mike's company and the idea that Mike's company is flawed, then somebody runs off to go to somebody else. So, to Mr. Wadsworth, the point earlier, we need to come together. I don't need to be burdening the superintendent with calling you and says, how my one child needs and how my one child is going to be elevated at the expense of the other children by using them as rungs in my ladder to an imaginary success. So I would I would ask that when you are in out in social media that you take a look at what it is that we can do to help our teachers retain our branding. They're killing themselves to do that and not run false information and slanderous comments up the flagpole just to make yourself the hero of uh, whatever chat room you're in today. Because there is a direct relationship between this district needing to be subsidized in a way that the state refuses to do, that the federal government refuses to do. And I'm sorry, but math class in and of itself is not exciting to attract students who are looking for a career in either the sciences or some practical thing like welding or something like that. But to Mike's point, these numbers are real. They're not going to get any better. And the only way to get them better is to find something good to say about your district instead of carrying on this whatever it is that's going on. There are a lot of people out there that are quiet. And in their silence, there's a vote of confidence that we need right now. So speak up a little bit. You don't have to fight with these people. I was the worst gad fighting in history. When I take after some things happen, say something positive and find a way to compliment a kid to make sure that they know they're going to the right place. Because I know that. Mike? Nothing for me. I agree with you, Ken. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Where's Tim? Is Tim there or did he get kicked off? Tim always has a good question. Tim is not there. Wellness check. Oh, <laughs> um, Tim, Tim, Tim wants his internet connection. Okay, so let's, um, uh, good point, Ken. And I think I said that on Saturday. Sometimes the silent people are, are big in numbers, bigger than the ones that are, you know, sometimes having negative things to say. So if we go ahead and call for the vote. Paul Scrap, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. We have a four and then we have one absent. Um, board members, I, I apologize. I need to go back to 11A, the adoption of the Los Angeles County Plan for expelled students. We did have a discussion. Ken, you moved it in. Chad, you seconded, but we did not call for the vote. So Paul Scrap, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wallace, Kelly Jensen and I, that's for one absent that passes. Next we have 12B, certification of signature resolution. Um, can I get someone to move this in? I'll move it in. Chad Wallace with second. Thank you, Mr. King. So there's two columns on that form. The left side is typically for board members, the right side is for staff. By approving this, we'll allow Mr. Murray to be a signature for contracts and uh, warrants. I have a I have a comment on that. Mr. Merzo will be required to remove the frosted Viking charms graphic from the budget presentation. <laughs> I will I'll be fine with that. It is it is St. Patrick's Day. Let's call for the vote. Paul's graph, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. I don't believe Mr. is still in there, right? Four and Mr. Jorgensen absent. Four one that passes. 12C, winter um, consolidated application. Can I get someone to move this in? I'll move it in, Paul's graph. I'll second it. Second, Mike. Mr. King. 
Okay, so this is uh, the con app is something you approve every year. This has to do with a any funding that you generally start with the word title. So when we hear title one funding, title two funding, title three funding, title six funding, so on and so forth. Uh, title one has to do with disadvantaged students, title two has to do with high quality uh, staff development, training, and retention of uh, teachers and, and all staff. Um, and so uh, this this report encapsulates all those categorical funding sources. And so it's our recommendation that you would improve the kind of uh, and Mr. Merce is on the line if you have any further questions or something more in depth, but but that's that's what you would be this evening. Questions or comments? Okay, let's call for the vote. Falls graph aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. That's a four with one absent. That passes. Um, next, we have 12D, opening the CFD fund, fund 49 for community facilities districts project. Can I get someone to move this in? I'll move it in. Mike Fox. Chad Wadsworth, seconds. Mr. King. Okay. And I'm putting Mr. Jorgensen on speakerphone on my cell phone for the record. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, you're on speakerphone just so you're aware of it. Um, so just on the uh, the CFB fund, as you may recall, um, we had Adam Bauer come in to make a presentation on February 27, 2020 to the board. You approved the contract with Feldman and Roloff that Adam Bauer works for. And, and this has to do with the development being set up between Acton and Abadose. It's a, a residential development in the very, very early stages. They have a long ways to go, but this essentially is um, like a holding place for the funds to be transferred in and out as they have to take into consideration a school district that could be impacted by the development. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Call for the vote. Well, I just have a comment. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, I, I I wish them well within the confines of the community standards district because this uh, fund is for capital improvements, but it's students for the schools, and students is what we need because this community is not making very many babies. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of a community with a healthy school system, I wish them all the best. Yeah. Uh, which has nothing to do with this. Back to what Mike said, I have worn myself out trying to make that goal. Call so. uh, <laughs> yeah. for the vote. Falls Graf, I. Mike Fox, I. Chad Wadsworth, I. Tim Jorgensen is an I. Kelly Jensen is an I. That's a 5 0. The vote carries. Thank you. Um, so, next, we're going to do future agenda items. So, is there anyone that wants to add to the agenda? I would really like to see something about ASMO, please. Thank you, Mr. Falsgraf, for bringing that up. And, and Madam President, I'd like to ask if um, we could have Mr. King uh, do as he did at the beginning of this meeting or during his the gold standard report, um, maybe go into depth and speak to the, the roles and the duties of the top three uh, superintendent, assistant superintendent, super assistant, uh, Mr. Merza's position, so that maybe the public could understand why we need these people in our district. Uh, if we could break it down, you know, to where the average person can understand it and, and, and really sink in, I think it would be beneficial to the community to know that there's the, the top three people aren't just sitting here in an office in some big fluffy chair pointing fingers, they actually have multiple roles that they do. I think it would be good for transparency. Thank you. Also, um, I'd like to add the, um, we did talk about the eligibility for sports, correct, Mr. King? Correct. That will be coming up. And also, I would like to, um, on Saturday, we did talk about charter law, and Ms. Shea Patterson had some stuff to present. We ran out of time. So um, I'd like to give some time to Shea Patterson to talk about um, um, her portion of oversight of charters. Anyone else? Kelly. Um, to um, Mr. Wadsworth's point, I, I, I really hate having people advocate for themselves to make it look like they're really valuable. I would suggest that the terms of the contract or the job descriptions for those each of those positions, the most current job description uh, and, and contract terms as to what's expected as part of the attachment for that report. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Falsgraf. We, um, 
I have expressed that it's important to know what people do. So thank you. And but thanks to our staff for everything they do. Okay, so um, anything else we want on future agenda items? That's a lot. Was Tim there? He just dropped off. I don't know. Um, our next calendar, we have our next board meeting is um, March 25th. Hang on, he's here. Is he back? I'm back. I don't have anything. Okay, nothing to add to the future agenda. Okay, so we're on the calendar. Uh, March 25th is our regular board meeting, and then um, spring break. Boy, does everybody need it. April 5th to the 9th, so we want to wish everyone a happy spring break, and then we'll be back on April 22nd. Unless there's something with all the changes with COVID, please understand community that things come very quickly and sometimes we might have to make some decisions. So we are reminding everyone to keep checking the website because if we do have to have an emergency board meeting, it could happen. Um, we have nothing to report out from post session this evening. There was no action taken. And then with that, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mike Fox. I'll second that. So I'd like to call for the vote. Paul Jeff, aye. Mike Box, aye. Ted Wadsworth, aye. Kevin Jorgensen, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. So we're going to adjourn this meeting at 9.28 p.m. If anyone's on the line, we're going to go in and have, we're going to start our, our next board meeting. Uh, I don't believe we have no reports and any public comments on the item. None. Thank you. We'll move on to 3A. Addendum to the Memorandum of Understanding the MOU between ADA and the Akinakwadosa Unified School District. I get someone to move this in. I'll move it in. Paul Chad Chadwatt with second. Thank you, Mr. King. So I first of all I see some teachers online um, that were part of the negotiating team for the Akinakwadosa Teachers Association along with um, our administrative team and Kim Shaw, our chief negotiator. I appreciate everybody who's been at the table. I know it's been extremely exhausting uh, going through the process, but um, I commend you for it. And uh, we are to recommend what you develop jointly as a addendum to the original memorandum of understanding dated August 7, 2020. In the addendum, it identifies the grades TK through two of commence in person instruction on a hybrid model beginning on Wednesday, March 17, 2021. Uh, students in grades three through four will do so on Monday, March 22nd, and uh, as well with grades five and six. Um, also, it's important to note that it's the intent of both the district and the association to return to on-site learning as soon as uh, it's feasible, consistent with the applicable law, both state and local, and the Department of Public Health. It's the intent of both the district and the association to ensure that the members are provided with an opportunity to start the vaccination cycle before being required to come to work. We've also made sure the district will accommodate those unit members who have already made vaccine appointments and have them scheduled. And we'll make sure that um, they're given release time uh, for scheduled vaccination appointments that is um, occurring during the afternoon virtual instruction hours. Um, other health and safety issues, we've addressed the HVAC uh, uh, issue. We have the um, MERV 13, which meets the standard for ensuring that our filtration system is uh, current and safe. In addition, we've also, as I indicated at the earlier board meeting, um, we're going to bring forward to the board uh, items that ratify the purchase of air purifiers for the classroom. Uh, the cost, I think the fiscal impact of that was um, $19,000. And so we'll be bringing that to the board as well. And I'll, again, I'll just state for the public that that is coming out of um, what are called the ESSER funds, um, elementary and secondary emergency relief funds number two. So this is the second cycle of funds that has come to the district and we're, we're using those funds appropriately to make sure that uh, we're providing a safe environment for staff and students. Um, in, in accordance with the last uh, MOU that you also approved, uh, teachers do uh, get 10 days uh, to uh, notice before they return to the classroom. 
two of those 10 days are allocated for preparation time. So they'll do a check-in with their students in the morning and then um, have the rest of the day to prepare uh, for in-person instruction and their hybrid model that they'll be uh, engaged in. There is one change. I'm gonna ask that the board adopt um, this addendum with the corrected version, which has already been updated. And on the exhibits, some of the exhibits were cut and pasted mistakenly uh, of virtual on day two for a cohort instead of in person. And those were in the mornings. Those have since been adjusted. And, uh, and, and so I, again, they were pretty fast through this. And so I appreciate them getting to us. And, it was just a typo. So if the board has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Um, it, it's my understanding that we have been focused on the, the, the special needs group first, then an element of the high school. Um, I am feeling for the seventh and eighth graders, and I know that they haven't dropped off space of earth. I'm expecting that these negotiations are going to continue in anticipation that the day will come where they will finally be recognized as human beings and ready to come back to school. So I don't think there should be a big gap here, but I don't think that we cut and paste this stuff because I think as kids mature, they, their needs are different and their behaviors are different. And uh, so let's keep the negotiations going until we have a full uh, thing for the county and the state to come along and mess it all up again for the third time. That's all I have. Uh, just uh, very briefly, I want to thank the, the teachers. Um, they're on the front lines. They're the ones going back to the classroom with all the kids. And uh, I res respect what you're doing. I respect uh, your occupation and thank you very much. Uh, our kids, you know, they need to see you and uh, I'm glad they're gonna, you're gonna get to see them. Thank you. I'll echo the same as sentiments of Mr. Fox. Uh, thank you teachers for coming back and uh, making a fair deal for everybody to uh, go back in the classroom. It's, uh, it's great to see that everybody's coming together. It's gonna be awesome to see the kids back to class and the excitement that that's going to bring. Uh, I too, as Mr. Falk, uh, Mr. Uh, Falscraft said, um, I look forward to seeing uh, what we can do with the seventh and eighth graders uh, here in the near future. That's all I have. I'm just proud of all my former colleagues for the work that they're doing and the agreement they are to get back. And I know they want to see their students. That's the best place to get with them and teach them and provide them with quality education. Work together and be safe and we'll get everybody back as soon as possible. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I did say it earlier, but I, I think it's worth repeating. Um, teachers, thank you so much. And for everybody that worked with the negotiations to get our kids back to school. And I still do want to recognize our classified staff who's been back for quite a while. And so um, I think everyone that's been doing the work and bringing our kids back. A couple of comments, Mr. King, you did mention EFRA funding. So for the, um, for the public, as we've talked about money this evening, just to be a little bit more clear, ESSER funding was sent to school districts to pay for COVID type situations to get kids back to school to pay for the stuff to keep our kids safe and healthy and other things related to COVID. So I just wanna make sure that everybody understands as we've been talking about budget tonight, that that's not coming out of the budget, which Mr. Omerza mentioned this evening, it's coming out of a, a special funding for COVID related situations. So. I just want to clear that up. And also, um, Mr. King, we, uh, going back to what Ken said, getting everyone back and, and going back to the table and getting this done. Just to be clear, things are changing rapidly. When we talked in this MOU, that was because we were in the purple zone. We could only bring back a certain percentage of students. And at that time, it was only approved for K-6 other than special group of students. Sure. So I don't want to make anyone think that we're not caring about all of our students. That was the situation we had a couple days ago. Correct. Now we're moving into the red zone. Right. Now that changes that we can bring other students back. That's correct. So I don't want to give the public the, the impression that Mrs. Jensen doesn't love all kids because we didn't want to bring back all of our students, but now we're moving into a new tier, correct? Right? Correct. Right. So I just want to clarify that. All right. Anything else? All right, so let's go back and um, call to adjourn at 9.37. Oh, make, make a motion, but oh, uh, It's moved in, so all we have to do, okay. I think, is call it. Because we already moved it. Moved it in. Okay, call for the vote. Am I right? Yes, correct. Yes. Yes. Paul Giraffe, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Kim Jorgensen, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. That's a 5-0 vote.
Now we're going to vote to make a motion to adjourn. Mike Fox, so moved. Chad Walker, second. Call for the vote. Paul Strap, aye. Mike Fox, aye. Chad Wadsworth, aye. Tim Jorgensen, aye. Kelly Jensen, aye. That's a five-zero vote. We're going to adjourn at 9.38 p.m. Thank you, everyone.